and welcome to another edition of Things We Said Today. This is a Beatles talk show podcast that we do every two weeks, where we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles, their years together, their solo years, their music, their history, any aspects of, of their lives we cover here on this show. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the regular co-hosts of this program, known for my syndicated Beatles radio show called Every Little Thing. Also for another talk show podcast that I do on the solo careers of the Beatles called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And I also have my own YouTube channel that is loaded with Beatle content, and that's called Ken Michaels Radio. I'm being joined by two of my regulars, Alan Cozen, who you've known for being uh, one of the writers at the New York Times for many years in their classical department. And also he's written a couple of uh, Beatle books including Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and uh, The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, and soon to be out, the clock is ticking, in December, the McCartney Legacy. Volume one. <laughs> is uh, co-authoring with Adrian Sinclair, part one of, well, hopefully 27 volumes, I'm hoping. <laughs> Alan, welcome. Ken, how are you doing? I think if Alan had to write 27 volumes, a rubber yeah. room with his name on it is awaiting. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah we're thinking more like four. <laughs> I think if you had 27 volumes, they may get done before Mark Lewison's. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we love you, Mark. Anyway, Darren DeVivo is with us. He sure. has uh, been on the air at uh, WFUV, Fordham University, for nearly... 40 years and he's been their Beatle guy there great DJ done a lot of fantastic interviews and always a great co-host to work with here hello Darren hello Ken hello Alan on today's show we have a special guest with us and it's Jay Bergen you've heard me mention his name here on the show because I did a couple of interviews with him from our YouTube channel. And he was John Lennon's defense attorney, just put out a brand new book called Lennon, The Bobster and the Lawyer, all concerning um, a trial that, that John went through with mobster Morris Levy, uh, concerning a copyright infringement uh, suit with the song Come Together, with a line being lifted, though not totally accurately lifted <laughs> from uh, Chuck Berry's You Can't Catch Me. And um, it tells the whole story of what John went through, what Jay went through at the time um, in this case. And Jay, it's great to have you on our show. Thank you very much, Ken. And I'm delighted to be here with, uh, uh, with uh, Alan and Darren and uh, the three of you, the three mm -hmm. musketeers. <laughs> Before we talk about this, the uh, the court case, I think it's worth mentioning that um, you said in your book that you had a dorm at Fordham University, and you got to uh, go to an Elvis Presley concert that you told John about. But Darren works at WFUV, so well, the two of you are kind of like comrades here. Yes, I I graduated from uh, Fordham College and. 1959, and uh -huh. uh, lived in on the campus. Rochelle, and, and when uh, when I saw an ad, probably in the the old Herald Tribune, the New York Herald Tribune, for an Elvis concert in uh, Philadelphia in April of 1957, um, I sent away and got two tickets, and uh, never been in Philadelphia, couldn't get anybody to go with me. Uh, even my roommate, who uh, we, I roomed with uh, Jerry Breslin for three years, and uh, so I went along. Mm -hmm. I saw Elvis, University. The, the real Elvis. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. Well, we've got a couple of Fordham Rams here. Yes. I'm uh, class of 87. Okay. And my wife got her master's there, and my daughter graduated there in 2019. Oh, great. And and I've been at WFUV since it'll be it'll be actually exactly thirty eight years really. Uh, it was my first show there in February eighty four, nineteen eighty four. So 
Um, it's been a second home because I'm orig- I'm from the Bronx and grew up, lived two miles away from the campus. So it all was right there in my backyard. Well, my whole family, my, my mother's family and my father's family were uh, from the Bronx also uh, around uh, Talon time. And sure. also um, my father was raised in uh, Highbridge. Okay, yeah, Stone yeah. Throw. Yep, 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 yep. So in my, yep. my youth, I spent uh, a lot of time in the Bronx. Yeah, absolutely. So the Bronx is in the house. <laughs> <laughs> and so is Fordham. Yep. yep. <laughs> so what do you remember, before we talk about John here, what do you remember about the Elvis Presley concert? And when you spoke about it with John, uh, what was that like? Well, um, I, what I remember about the concert is, uh, you know, kind of getting there, but then it was in a, uh, a place called the arena. And it turned out that that was a, like a minor league hockey uh, arena. So it was kind of shaped like a hockey rink and had a, a balcony around three quarters uh, of the, uh, the arena. And I wound up with uh, this, this, my seat was in the first row uh, of the balcony, uh, which only had like three rows of seats. Uh, and I was looking directly down uh, onto the stage. And of course, uh, I think there were only a few thousand people there. He did two shows uh, each night uh, for two consecutive nights. Mm-hmm. But I was there for the first show the first night. And um, and John and I talked a lot about rock and roll. And uh, I don't know where we, I think we were walking through Central Park uh, back towards the Dakota. And I mentioned that I had seen Elvis. And he said, oh, he said, the first time, the first time I heard Heartbreak Hotel by Elvis, I knew what I wanted to do. Mm. And so I had to tell him the whole story, how I sent away for the, the tickets. I got two tickets. I think they were like three fifty, three dollars and fifty cents each. Mm-hmm. Um, I couldn't get anybody to go with me, so I took the subway down to the old uh, Greyhound bus terminal, which was opposite the the old Madison Square Garden on Fiftieth Street and Eighth Avenue. And I took a bus to Philadelphia. Figured out how I could take the. There was a subway. That got me to the arena, and uh, the, the show was it was fantastic. He only sang for about fifty or fifty-five minutes, but you know it was electrifying, and the crowd was, you know, really excited. Considering the fact that he was the biggest name in music at the time, I'm surprised you you couldn't find someone to go with you. Look, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was I was a rock and roller. And uh, I don't think there were many um, who, um, who were really into rock and roll. Uh, at least the, we lived in a, in a brand new dorm and we were in an apartment that had a living room, four bedrooms with two guys in each and a bathroom. Uh-huh. Um, no one would go and I, you know, I asked other people of course in the dorm, but uh, I don't know. I, I didn't understand it and I didn't care. I, I was going to go. <laughs> did John tell you about did John tell you about the time he and, and the rest of the Beatles met Elvis? No. Okay. No, he was just he was just really focused, uh, Alan, on uh, that this was in 1957. It was before he went into the army. Right. Uh, this was this was really, you know, early. Uh, and before Colonel Parker, you know, got his hooks into him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, several of our friends have asked me if I've seen the, you know, have you seen the movie Elvis? And I said, no. And they said, why? I said, well, first of all, it got a terrible review in the New York Times. And secondly, it's like almost three hours long. And thirdly, I've seen Elvis. I saw him before you know, he turned into what he turned into. You know what John said when he was asked about what he felt about Elvis dying? 
He said mm -hmm. uh, uh, Elvis died when he went into the army. That's what I thought about Elvis dying. <laughs> yes, I yes, I've heard that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm right. just, um, I don't mean to get back off the subject very quickly. Do you remember the name of the dorm that you were in, Jay? It was called Martyr's Court. Yes, I had a feeling that was, it sounded like you just, Martyr's Court now was one of the more run down oh, uh, dorms. It? Yeah, it's not one of the nicer dorms on campus. And it's, um, when you were describing the layout, I was thinking it sounded like, it sounded like a martyr's dorm. Yes, it was. In fact, we were, I think it was Martyrs Court uh, yeah. Stairwell F. It was the one closest to uh, Fordham Road. Okay. Yep. 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 Um, you, you mentioned Elvis played for about fifty minutes or so. Now the Beatles shows years later would be in the ballpark of a little over half an hour, I think. So that actually was fairly long for that time for a headliner to perform, close to an hour. Well, I, I don't know. I had been to a number of, uh, of uh, Alan Freed shows in uh, the Brooklyn Paramount mm -hmm. and uh, the Fabian's Fox in Brooklyn and also the um, New York Paramount. And of course, they were long shows because, first of all, they, they usually had a movie uh, before, an Alan Freed rock and roll movie. And then, you know, there'd be a number of, of acts. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't just one act because a lot of these groups only had one or two songs that they knew. You know, the harp tones, the cleft tones, the Cadillacs. Uh... <laughs> Great names. <laughs> I wish I can go back in time and see one of those shows because yeah. they're so legendary now just because of the name Alan Freed, let alone all the acts. But yeah, but it took someone like Darren to turn Fordham into a rock and roll place. Yeah, that's it. That's exactly what I did. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, let's get to the story about this this um, this trial between John Lennon and Morris Levy. Give us some background. I know you've talked about this many times already when you've done interviews, but what this whole thing was about, because it all was the result. It started with John lifting a line from You Can't Catch Me um, and come together he sang, uh, here come old flat top. And actually Chuck Berry sang, here come a flat top. And um, the result was that there was an agreement made between the two of them that John would record three songs that Morris Levy owned in his publishing, the Big Seven catalog. And, um, you know, not, not only this thing about the line, but I don't know, you're probably aware of this, Jay, but Paul McCartney, was aware of the similarity between Come Together and You Can't Catch Me. And he suggested originally it was going to be a faster song, Come Together. But Paul made the suggestion to slow it down. He called it Swamp Rock in a way to hopefully disguise the song a little bit more so that it wouldn't sound like You Can't Catch Me. But I always found it a little bit odd that, the, that this revolved around a line from the song when melodically it's a little bit well, more than a little bit similar between the two. But um, <laughs> talk about how, the, how this whole thing started. Well, the, the you know, Morris was well known for uh, filing copyright infringement cases. Uh, many of them were uh, bogus. Uh, as, uh, as the four of us know, he often just put his name on uh, songs, uh, thereby, you know, chiseling uh, some of the music publishing royalties. Uh, for example, he's one of the co-writers on uh, Yaya. Mm -hmm. And we all know he didn't, you know, he didn't contribute to that at all. But, um, you know, he, he brought this lawsuit, but the, the complaint was only like three pages long. And it focused on those two lines and in fact attached as exhibits uh, I think two pages from the uh, You Can't Catch Me um, lyric sheet, you know, the, the song sheet, because the Chuck Berry line was in the second verse. And then there was one page from the, uh, the Lennon song, Come Together. And, and in fact, the complaint, uh, I put it up on my uh, uh, Facebook and Instagram uh, just a couple of weeks ago. 
because there was nothing in the complaint that alleged that the music, that any of the music was copied. Hmm. The whole thing was focused on those two, those two lines. And the case started in 1970. Uh, and by 73, the, the latter part of 73, when John was in California and got this idea to hire Phil Spector to produce this rock and roll album of all the oldies that he grew up listening to, mm. um, the case all of a sudden was about to come to trial. And he said to, and I, it was probably Harold Sider, who was his business advisor then, he said to him, uh, I, I'm, I can't come to New York, I'm, I'm, I'm working. You, you know I can only do one thing when I'm working. Mm -hmm. So just deal with it, settle it. And, um, and that's how the settlement came. And uh, I believe that, that Sider initially offered Morris uh, money, uh, but uh, Morris turned that down I think because he wanted to somehow kind of get his hooks into John. So the agreement was you record three songs on the next album, which was supposed to be the rock and roll album. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of them had to be, you can't catch me. But then unfortunately, uh, Phil, right before the end of 19, uh, 1973, unbeknownst to John, he was taking the master tapes home every night and he just disappeared. And it took until the following summer uh, in July of 74 for uh, Capital to retrieve them from Phil. Hmm. I, I don't know whether you've ever you've heard some of the stories, but when Capital was negotiating, uh, this was a story that I've heard uh, and not from John, uh, when they were negotiating with Phil finally, uh, and there was going to be this transfer of the tapes in exchange for uh, $90,000, um, Phil wouldn't come out of his uh, chateau in Los Angeles because he claimed that there were black helicopters from the CIA circling overhead. Um, he didn't get any more sane. <laughs> over the years <laughs> no well and then of course it's also well known that he fired a pistol into the ceiling uh of the uh a and m studios uh bathroom the men's room mm -hmm. yeah so um, so that was the settlement right i'm curious about uh this where why did specter take the tapes where did specter go and was he completely MIA for a while, or did they know where he was and couldn't get at him? Uh, there was a story that he'd been in some terrible automobile accident, but they just could not reach him. I mean, Capital tried, uh, John tried, and then John just kind of gave up uh, in, uh, in 1974. Uh, but Capital, you know, kept, kept after him. Um, and finally shipped, uh, I think there were 25 or 28 boxes of tapes to John, which arrived at the record plant just as he was about to start recording Walls and Bridges. He'd finally gotten, you know, he'd gotten bored. He, uh, he produced um, Harry Nielsen's album, uh, Pussycat, mm -hmm. and then wrote some songs and brought the band in and after he listened to some of the tapes, he realized he had just too much work to do. They were, you know, they were a mess. Mm -hmm. A lot of them, a lot of the, the different tracks were, were a mess. A lot of drinking, a lot of, some of them, there were 28 musicians playing at the same time. Mm -hmm. right. right. And can you explain for, for our viewers that don't know the history of Morris Levy, how dangerous a man he was? Well, Morris, <clears throat> Morris grew up in the Bronx. Uh, I don't think Darren ever met him. Uh, they're probably a little older than, than Darren, but he grew up in the Bronx. Uh, he was kicked out of school. I, I think it might even been middle, middle school. Uh, one story was that he assaulted a teacher, but he started working for the mob in nightclubs down in uh, Florida. And 
1949, he uh, started, um, you know, the great jazz club on, um, on Times Square. And the name is escaping me right now. Is it Birdland? Hmm? Or is it Birdland? Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Boy. Birdland. And then in 1950, that was with Mob Money. And then in 1956, he started Roulette Records. And I didn't learn this until um, when I started working on the case, but he was, he was uh, Alan Freed's manager. And he was also the promoter of a lot of the, the shows that I saw in the Brooklyn Paramount that, with Alan Freed as the, uh, as the MC. Hmm. Uh, so he was, he was completely tied into uh, the, uh, the Genovese crime family. They, they really controlled him. Uh, Thomas Eboli uh, was one of his uh, silent partners in some of his uh, publishing companies and record companies. And uh, I know that, uh, you know, there were mobsters hanging out in the offices of, of uh, uh, of uh, Roulette Records and his publishing companies, you know, all the time. Did that make it difficult for you in any way or, or for John? I mean, did you, did you have in the back of your minds that, you know, we're, we're defending this case, but what if these guys come after us? No, and it, and it never came up, uh, Alan. Uh, I, I, I kind of assumed, not that I gave it a lot of thought, that Morris was not going to do anything uh, rash or stupid because of the high profile hmm. and particularly since when we get into the the lawsuit uh he started the lawsuit right he started and in fact he started two of them mm -hmm. <clears throat> hmm. and john's claims and and capital and emi were counterclaims Mm -hmm. it's interesting another thing that you you mentioned in passing in the book that um viewers might find interesting is that the the character of Hesh and the Sopranos was based on him. Yes. <laughs> yes, because, you know, uh, Morris had this big horse farm up in uh, Ghent, New York, uh, a lot of a lot of land. And um, Hesh had a, a horse farm, too. Mm -hmm. When I watch The Sopranos, I, I, I remember thinking, you know, it sounds like Morris Levy. <laughs> You know, I mean, for one thing, you, you don't have how many Jewish record, record executives involved with the mafia have there been? I mean, there might have been a few, but Morris Levy is like the most famous. So it just seemed, you know, and when, when when this character was on that it, it that it, that there had to be some connection. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, he he had all kinds of nicknames. He was called the octopus because he had his tentacles in everything and strawberries, the, uh, the string of uh, record stores that he had up through New England. And uh, he mm -hmm. was also called the godfather, uh, the record business. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I've been to strawberry several times back when they were in business since I live in New England. But um, I'll, I'll, what you say in the book is that a lot of this was the result of, you know, I, I don't want to blame John for this, but because of the fact that John was getting bad publicity for his time in Los Angeles, he was afraid of how well received the rock and roll album would be. So he said to Morris that he was considering putting a, an ad on television for this, and that gave Morris the idea to do the same. Yes. Well, well of course, John... John did not know Morris. He didn't know anything about him the first time they met uh, in October of 1974 uh, at the club that uh, the club Cavalero that uh, uh, Morris belonged to. Uh, so he didn't he didn't know that Morris Levy also had a company named Adam Eight, which specialized in selling uh, records uh, on TV. Send in your 498 or your 598 or whatever, and we'll send it to you. So uh, when he mentioned that, it was just he was trying to explain, uh, as he testified, you know, I didn't know the man, and and he, uh, I heard he was angry at me, and 
one of the things that I, I learned spending time with John was uh, A, he was shy and B, he did not like saying no to people. So he, he, he wanted to, you know, keep everything kind of smooth and, uh, and, and he was explaining, as you said, Ken, to Morris, you know, there was a lot of bad publicity. And on top of that, here I am, I'm recording classic rock and roll songs from the early 50s. And everybody's going to be sitting there waiting to take a, take a shot at me. Yeah. So it, was, you know, so it was, it was a surprise, yeah. I think. I, I, I would think John was probably surprised when, when Mara said, oh, well, I, I can do that. I have this company. Right, yeah. Actually, John came up with a pretty good idea because it was around that time when there was a revival of 50s rock and roll, you know? So, uh, you know, with American Graffiti being popular and Happy Days and, you know, there'd be cover versions of 50s rockers uh, in the 70s that did really well. So actually, you know, good timing on John's part, even though he didn't realize it, I think, to do something like that. But I always remember John saying that he just wanted to go into the studio and be Ronnie, be Ronnie Spector and just sing these songs with a band, you know, a great band to back him up, which he had. But um, yeah, but there's, go ahead, Darren. No, dude, quick question. One of the things I learned was that I always was under the impression that the, the rock and roll album was born out of the fact that John had to record these songs. But what I'm hearing here is that John had already had the idea and had started, <clears throat> at least he had the idea to do a covers album of vintage rock and roll songs. And then along came this case. That's right. Right. And it was uh, probably fairly painless for John, unless he was really set on a certain batch of songs to just add a few more in here to make Morris Levy happy. Well, and it was, it was, uh, you know, Darren, it was very early in the, in the Spectre sessions when all of a sudden John gets this call, you know, you got to go back to New York because this case is going to trial. So, I mean, he, as he testified, he just wanted to, I mean, he had finished um, Mind Games, that was out, and he just wanted to sing somebody else's songs, and then he came up with the idea of, well, we'll go back to the songs that uh, influenced me when I was a child. And then comes the court case, this yes. lawsuit. Right. right, right, that interrupts the... right. It's funny because I always thought of it the way Darren just said that that he had to do the album because of of um, Levy and the uh, and the come together settlement. But um, so it, it's it's an incredible coincidence in a way that he was recording an oldies album um, right when it turned out that that was also going to be the solution to that previous lawsuit about come together. Yes, yeah, it was, and if Phil hadn't flipped out well you know if ifs and buts are candy nuts but we <laughs> we won't have a hell of a christmas you know but yeah. um yeah it wasn't that's that didn't happen yeah and of course morris claimed uh that uh you know walls and bridges was the next album and that that meant that those songs were supposed to be on that album and morris knew just as well as everybody else did that those songs would not fit uh, on a an album of uh, John's original songs, mm -hmm. Walls and Bridges. And so the original dinner on October 8th, um, 73 or 74? 74. 74. Uh, was to explain this to Morris, that it was supposed to be the next album, Rock and Roll, but because of Phil, it wasn't. Um, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, Cider, uh, Harold Cider explained to John, you've got to meet this man uh, because he's, he's angry and you just kind of have to explain it. And I think as, as John testified, and I think it's in the book where he said, well, if after I finished explaining it, you know, then I could relax. You know, John was very, uh, very naive about business. Uh, he didn't, that wasn't his job. He didn't, he didn't want to get involved in it. And, 
you know, later in, in, in 1975, when I interviewed Klaus Vormann, uh, he said that. He said, you know, John's very naive about business. He, does, he just doesn't, he doesn't get it. <laughs> we actually did see a little bit of, I don't know, um, Jay, if you saw Peter Jackson's Get Back film. I did. Yeah, well, there's that, you know, towards the, the, as you're starting to move closer and closer to the rooftop performance, John one day starts talking about this guy, Alan Klein, that he has a meeting with, and almost as if it's, it's, it's some sort of spiritual being that John met. He's talking in such glowing terms about Alan Klein, uh, and yet Glenn Johns, who has had experience with Alan Klein, is going, uh, John, uh... But John is so so taken by this this individual who was a known um, how would you say politely he was a crooked crooked businessman um, but yet John was still completely smitten uh, with whatever bill of goods Alan Klein sold him at an initial meeting and John I, was like you got to meet this guy he's going to manage us and I, yeah I don't I don't know where any of that. Uh, came from, because uh, as you pointed out, Darren, I mean, Alan already had a, a very, very negative uh, reputation. And in fact, uh, I think that the, the song on Walls and Bridges, Steel and Glass, uh, <laughs> is about Alan. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. Very, very negative, very negative song. Hmm. Well, John also, went hook, line, and sinker for Magic Alex. You know, <laughs> um, he, he, he did have this naive side, I guess. So. Yes. I mean, Klaus explained it like, you know, John would suddenly start talking about, uh, well, I'm thinking about doing an album with Bob Dylan. Uh, and, you know, of course, not even thinking that Dylan's with one album, one one record company, and he's with another company. How are you? How are you going to do that? But uh, that's the way his uh, his mind worked. So let's talk a little bit about how the Roots album came about, because um, John had sent Morris Levy. They were really rough mixes of the rock and roll sessions. And Morris apparently was really impatient. He wanted those three songs real badly. And he put them out there on, with this TV offer. And, um, and John, Capitol Records were furious about this whole thing. And could you, ex you know, explain how that came about? Well, I mean, the first time I met John was February 3rd. Uh, 1975, my partner, David Dalgenus, who had been hired uh, a few years before, after John left Klein, uh, to represent John in connection with the, the dissolution of the Beatles partnership. Hmm. Uh, and David asked me on February 3rd to go to a meeting at Capitol Records to hear or learn more about this bootleg album that was going to be put out by this person, Morris Levy, because Capital had begun hearing that Morris was, first of all, he, he told uh, Cider, uh, I'm going to put it out. I've got a shot. I've got a shot. Uh, at a meeting on, I think it was January 30th, uh, where Harold went to him and explained, you know, Capital wants to put this album out, just like all the other Beatles albums. And, and of course, Morris knew and had been told uh, previously uh, at the meeting at um, uh, the, ca the uh, cafe, uh, the uh, Club Caballero, I think it was called. Caballero. Yeah. Yeah. Caballero, that, you know, John was under contract to EMI and we'd have to get EMI's permission and everybody in the record business knew that. Yeah. So, uh, after John did the basic tracks with the same band uh, that played on Walls and Bridges in uh, October 21st to the 24th or the 25th uh, of uh, 74, Morris started hounding him. 
uh, where are my songs? I want to listen to my songs. And finally, John asked him, well, what do you want? Uh, do you want a cassette or what? No, I want a reel-to-reel -reel so I can listen to it uh, on a tape recorder in my office. And so John ordered up the two reel-to-reels, seven and a half IPS, rough mix. Uh, he testified at the trial that, you know, he doesn't like letting stuff out, but he thought, well, this was... This was good enough. It wasn't really terrible, but it was good enough that I could give it to Morris and he'd get off my back. <laughs> but when he told Harold Sider what he'd done, <laughs> uh, Harold said, I wish you hadn't done that. And now Morris, Morris had the album. <laughs> and that's the album he put out. It's a shame that John didn't just give him those few songs, you know, that like the three songs that he was promised and said he gave him a whole album's worth of material. And yeah, given him just the three did. songs on cassette. <laughs> yeah. 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 <clears throat> I mean, Capital hadn't even heard the album at this point. <laughs> right. It's just astonishing that someone, you know, I mean, Morris Levy was in the record business. He owned a record company that was, you know, a record company that put out some hits. I mean, I've got some roulette records. Uh, how could he have thought that he could take a John Lennon tape and put it out? He understood about contracts. He understood about exclusivity. You'd have to if you were the president of a record company. I, I just don't. I just don't get the chance he was taking there and thinking he was going to get away with that. It, it doesn't make sense. Well, Alan, I think uh, what, what he thought was that by threatening to put it out, that John Capital and EMI would come to him and do some kind of a deal. That's, what, that's why he said to, to, in a stream of curse words to Cider in a meeting in his office, I'm going to put it out. I got a shot. I got a shot. In other words, I'm going to throw it up against the wall and see what happens. And I, I, I've always been convinced that I, I think Morris thought, well, John settled this other case, you know, the, the come mm -hmm. together case. And now, now maybe I can get capital and EMI and John to, you know, buy me off. Okay. I mean, and one, that, thing, one, one thing he could realistically have thought that Capital and, and John would do would be to sue him for damages. <laughs> but, well, did. But, but, they, well, but they didn't. They didn't. I, when, when I met with the Capital lawyers, they said, why don't we go into it? It was one of them from headquarters uh, in California. Um, why don't we get, can we get an injunction? And I said, you know, first of all, getting an injunction against Morris putting out this album uh, is going to be difficult. It's it's going to take it's going to take time. Uh, it's going to be expensive to put the papers together. But the other thing is that you know, litigation is like uh, it's like a war. Uh, whoever fires the first shot by filing the lawsuit doesn't know what's going to happen next. Hmm. And I didn't want us to be to be trying to sue uh, Morris. I thought because John told me in that same meeting when I asked him how long it would would it take to uh, finish the album, he said uh, I can do it in two days. I can go into the record plant tomorrow, February fourth, and that's what he did. February fourth and fifth, on the sixth, the uh, the master. Uh, was uh, made at the at the cutting room and shipped to Capital. And in the meantime, Morris started buying the time and mm -hmm. advertising the album that weekend. And we sent a series of telegrams to TV stations uh, around the country saying, this is not the official uh, album. Mm -hmm. So th that's what happened. Uh, and then Morris... Morris was kind of trapped at that point because once the, uh, the, the, the Capitol album came out, he pulled the Roots album. I think he'd sold 1,270 copies. Uh, and about a week or 10 days later, 
he filed the first lawsuit. And that was the one in New York Supreme Court <clears throat> alleging breach of an oral contract, although he didn't say it was oral, he just said, we, we made an agreement on October 8th, 1974, giving me the worldwide rights to sell this album on TV. And uh, there were also some fraud claims in there. Mm -hmm. And when that didn't get a reaction from John or any, or Capital or EMI, two to two and a half weeks later, he filed an antitrust action in federal court, mm -hmm. which was a fatal mistake. Mm -hmm. That was the, I think that was really kind of the turning point, one of the turning points. Uh, because case, cases in New York Supreme Court move very slowly. Cases in federal court move very quickly. Apart from everything else, like there being no actual contract or agreement, um, there was no provision for how Morris was going to pay John royalties on the sales of this record. And, and um, I, I don't think that ever came up. Um, if, it, if it came up, I don't think it got into the book, but. Um, no, there was no, there were no provisions for the royalties. Who was going to pay, you know, who was going to pay anything? That was the, that was the really ridiculous part about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you're right, Alan. And on the Roots album, you've got two recordings on there that John ended up not releasing for Angel Baby and Be My Baby, because he didn't want those out. And for all these years, you know, a lot of Beatle fans and Lennon fans, you know, they're, they're happy that it came out because they some Beatle fans want everything. But um, just by the mere fact that John didn't include those two songs on rock and roll, that tells you how he felt about those recordings. No, they were, because they were awful. They were, they were really. <laughs> some people I know love Angel Baby a lot, so. I know it's a favorite song of John's, but he probably didn't like his recording of it. Well, and you know, John, John said that that was one of his all time favorite records. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But one of the great things about your book is reading all the transcripts about, you know, how John and Capitol felt that the release of Roots hurt the sales of rock and roll, which is understandable. It took some sales away from that. But whatever plans they had of promoting it were shelved. There was going to be a TV ad for rock and roll that John, uh, John was planning to make a commercial where he was going to be a rock and roller with his hair greased back and everything. And it was supposed to be in the style of, I think it was a Chubby Checker commercial at the time. And they had all these plans and they ended up getting shelved because Roots got in the way of it. Yeah, they, they was, there was very little promotion, no, no single. Mm -hmm. uh, he did one radio, um, radio uh, promotion, um, and then that was it. And was they even stand produced by me a single. Didn't Stand By Me come out from that? Yeah, that was a single. Yeah, yeah but it didn't come out. At the time. At the time or ahead of time. Mm. It, mm. it was not part of the you know, kind of the usual mm -hmm. chronology of, uh, of how they would promote it. They right. were very, there was no in-stores right away. That was another thing. They were forced to release Rock and Roll fairly soon after Walls and Bridges. There wasn't that big a gap between the two albums. And Capital was also forced to reduce the list price, which was like a dollar less than most albums at the time to try yeah. to help sales of Rock and Roll. Yeah, I mean, um, we don't have an idea of in a perfect world when Capital would have wanted to release rock and roll, do we? Or did that ever get to that point where they were beginning to put a plan in place for, all right, here's the date of release? No, no. He did, John did meet with the uh, Capital uh, marketing people on uh, January 28th, 1975 at the Sherry Netherland Hotel where Capital had uh, had a suite, and that's where they decided on the name. Uh, they also uh, reached out to the photographer mm -hmm. uh, Jurgen Vollmer, who happened to now be living in Brooklyn at the time, and got the 
the photo that he had taken in, I think, 60 or 61 of John standing in the doorway. Um, but no, there was, there was no pro projected release date at that point. Uh, and this was, you know, this was, of course, days before they learned uh, that Morris was actually going to put this thing out. Mm -hmm. And and how long did the ads run on television for Adam from Adam Eight for this Roots album? About a week. A week. Maybe maybe a little more because the rock and roll album came out on um, the thirteenth of February, mm -hmm. and when that came out, Morris stopped advertising. Gotcha. And, and again, I think it was I think it was all part of a, a plan, Darren, because uh, the complaint in the state court case uh, came out, uh, I would say like a week or 10 days uh, after he dropped the, uh, the, the advertising. So I think it was always, it was always an idea in his mind, well, I'll sue and then I'll get them to come to the table. Mm -hmm. and, and of course he named Capital, DMI, John, Cider and Apple Records. How did this benefit or hurt the other songwriters and other publishers whose songs were on those albums um, from the sale of Roots, from the eventual release and sale of rock and roll? Do we have any sort of generalization on how they benefited, if, if, if at all, from those songs being covered and coming out in the middle of this storm? Well... One of the interesting things uh, that uh, John pointed out and that we pointed out, uh, Dave Marsh testified as an expert on the counterclaims, was that uh, on the Roots album, there was no credit given to the songwriters. Every song said John Lennon after it. So people who were not alive and aware of the songs in the 1950s uh, would think, John Lennon wrote these songs, mm. whereas people who were alive would think, well, wait a minute, uh, is John Lennon claiming uh, that uh, he wrote these songs? Because on the rock and roll album, the Capitol album, there's the usual detailed right. uh, credits. But I mean, the, the songwriters uh, for those songs got got their mechanical royalties on both albums. I, I would assume on the Roots album, they certainly got them on the, uh, on the rock and roll album. But again, but for the Roots album, the argument that, that Capital and EMI and we made was that the rock and roll album was, would have sold more copies. Mm -hmm. And that would have resulted in a higher income to those songwriters. And to John and Capital. And, and to John and Capital, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, there's one thing that I didn't understand in, in, when it got sort of just past that part of the book, where suddenly Capital bailed and made some sort of deal with Morris Levy. W what was that about and why did they do it? Do you, do you know why they did it? They did that behind my back mm -hmm. and, and John's back, of course. Uh, and I remember um, Barrett Prettyman, who was uh, a partner in the firm in uh, Washington, who was a, a heavy hitter. Mm -hmm. uh, Barrett was uh, well known for arguing cases in the Supreme Court, United States Supreme Court. And um, Shirtman approached him and I couldn't stop him from talking to, uh, to Shirtman, but I thought that he was going to be negotiating, you know, to settle the whole case. And over that weekend, I started thinking to myself, wait a minute, maybe they're going to settle and just leave us, John, holding the bag. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what they did. And when Barrett Prettyman called me to tell me that, uh, I really blew my top at him. And he said, look, Jay, uh, this is what the client wanted to do. The client for him, and EMI, for right? Yeah, EMI and, and capital. Yes, and we I should mean, say EMI. we should say for listeners who haven't read the book yet that Shirtman was Morris Levy's lawyer. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, 
<clears throat> yeah. And um, they settled for $170,000. Uh, Shirtman didn't want uh, Barrett Prettyman to tell me the amount, uh, but he told him he was going to tell me, and it was 170,000, and I think the down payment was, was 20,000, and, and the rest of it would be paid over time. But what was that for? Because you had already won the suit, the, the, the case. Um, at that point, you'd won, I think, the first two cases um, about the contract not existing. Yeah. And so and why, why would they have had to pay Levy anything? Like well, they didn't, pay any, they didn't pay Levy. He paid, he paid them. Oh, they, 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 so they basically negotiated down what Levy yes. was supposed to pay them. Okay, I yeah. see. Okay, now he, I understand. But they, they were supposed to get $220,000. Right. Yeah. And I guess they figured, look, uh, it's going to cost us X dollars. Uh, to If he appeals. For the appeal. Yeah. Uh, and let's, you know, take the money and, uh, and run. What I didn't understand, uh, Alan, was here was John Lennon, uh, who, along with the other Beatles, uh, had made mountains, mm -hmm. mountains of money and was still generating money for capital. But John and the, and the other Beatles contract had expired with EMI in January of 76. I don't know whether they decided that uh, we're just going to cut our losses or, or what. I don't know whether there was some negotiation going on uh, that I wasn't aware of about a new contract for John or, or what. I, I don't know. But I was stunned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, now I understand. I, 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 when I read it, I thought it was that they were going to be paying him, and I, and I couldn't no. understand that. So, okay. They, so they were just trying to sort of cheap out on the costs of the appeal. Yes. And, and get, I mean, I don't know whether Morris even paid them. Uh, he had to pay John mm -hmm. because when he filed the appeal, he had to put up a bond mm. to cover the entire amount of the damages. Okay. I have here a figure, well, several figures in your book, um, where you say Levy was awarded $6,795, but he had to pay EMI $109,700 $109, in lost revenue. And he had to pay John $42,000 for damages to his reputation. Yeah. Would, would that be the final figures? No, the, the final figures were... Uh, it was $274,500 to capital and EMI. Okay. John, it was uh, a total of $154,700 on, on page 290. So that the total bill was $429,200. I mean, Morris was really, he was up the creek. Uh, without a paddle. And, and of course, then, you know, I mean, he had the attorney's fees for. Mm. Yeah. Sure. But I think one thing that fans will be delighted to know about John was how he handled himself in court. I mean, that's what I found probably the most fascinating thing of all. He seemed really calm, very confident. He knew how to answer every single question. He knew not to give too much information. I mean, he had answers ready for everything, it seemed like, no matter how much he was challenged. I mean, we, we spent a lot of time going over the facts. Hmm. So, you know, John was ready. Uh, we were able to anticipate some things that we thought uh, uh, Morris's lawyers would, uh, would raise. Uh, and, you know, John never lost his temper. Uh, in the courtroom, uh, he he reacted very strongly a couple of times to something that Shirtman had said to him, but um, he really kind of toyed uh, with Shirtman because Shirtman was not really prepared to try this case. I don't know why, but he wasn't ready. There were actually. 
in a way, sort of two halves of, of your book. One was the way John handled himself in court, as Ken said, which is brilliant. And, you know, you have, you, you print a lot of the court transcripts. Um, I just think, you know, for anyone who hasn't looked at this book, um, it's important to know that because um, it's, it's the verbatim transcripts. And John was actually, I mean, the testimony was amazing about, how he makes records, what the process of making records is, how he personally approaches, um, you know, different album projects and that kind of thing. That's all great stuff. But the other side of it was John out of court. And one thing that I found really kind of fascinating was, you know, you can you can imagine how because he was who he was and was a little bit restricted on whether he could just sort of walk around and, you know, uh, be available to people, that he hadn't seen lots of things in New York City where he lived. So you took him to the uh, to Grand Central for the first time and the Waldorf for the first time. He'd never seen the Chrysler building. And you're showing him all these Art Deco buildings. And, and that must have been kind of interesting because, like, here is... Here's a guy who's who's interested in this kind of stuff, but hadn't seen it, and and you were able to be his guide for that kind of thing. Well, it you know it it just worked out that the the deposition when they took his deposition was in a, a building on Madison and like Forty Third Street, and uh, when we came out, you know, I knew about the Oyster Bar, sure, and I said, well, let's go over to Grand Central Station and. Uh, and we can have lunch there. And he said, well, I've never been to Grand Central Station. So, you know, we all know what a gorgeous building it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the same thing with, um, with the Waldorf. He'd never been in the Waldorf. Right. Yeah. If you think about it though, um, he came, Yoko, John and Yoko came to New York in 1972, right? 71? 71. 71. 71. And they, not long after that, separated. John went out to the West Coast for a lengthy period of time. So he was still in the process, I guess, of, of learning his, like now we could refer to it as his new hometown. Um, now that he was back in New York and he was in Manhattan with these court, with this case, you know, it was only like two, two and a half years removed of when he arrived and he had spent a big chunk of that time out in California anyway. That's true, but still you you wouldn't think of John Lennon just sort of by himself saying, no, no. I'm gonna go to Grand Central Station and stand <laughs> in the middle of, of the Great Hall there, you know? <laughs> no, no, but did he-, he get Did he get recognized? Uh, when he's like, actually like looking around, probably rather like wondrously looking around at the place, did anyone notice, hey, that's, that's John? Well, well, no, it, it wasn't until we got down to the oyster bar that the, you know, the maitre d' recognized him. But I mean, we we went in on the west entrance, right off Vanderbilt Avenue there, yeah. and we stood up on the bal stood on the balcony for a while, and he wanted to take it all in, and then we walked downstairs, and he walked around, you know, where the information booth is and the, the ticket the ticket booths on the right hand side and everything and nobody I, I nobody seemed to recognize who he was hmm. um and, and the same way uh walking from the the office building over there nobody bothered him and then the next day when the deposition ended right at the lunch break and we were just kind of walking and talking and I'm not even sure how, how we got on to the, the east side of Park Avenue. We were just walking, it was a beautiful May day. And uh, this woman, this middle-aged woman stopped in, in front of us and said, yeah, you're George Harrison. <laughs> and he said, yes, yes, I am, thank you. <laughs> and I've always, I've always wondered whether uh, she should have asked him for an autograph and I'll bet you uh, a pretty good chunk of money he would have signed George Harrison. George Harrison, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because as we all know, that was the kind of sense of humor he had. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Um, another thing that um, struck me is really kind of interesting in a, a small world kind of way. Uh, do you know Judge Richard Owen? Yes. Oh, yeah. So, so he presided over George Harrison's copyright suit for uh, My Sweet Lord and He's So Fine. That's right. And he, um, you know, like your judge was a harpsichordist who knew something about, uh, and his name was Griesa. Griesa? Griesa. Griesa. Um, he was a, a harpsichordist and pianist, didn't know anything about rock and roll, but knew about music. And yes. Judge, judge Owen was a composer who wrote an opera called Mary Dyer, which was performed in New York. And um, I think it's gets performed every now and then somewhere, you know. So for these two cases, both involving the members of the Beatles, you've got judges who are actually musicians. I, I think that's kind of interesting. And the, the two cases were, I think, tried not, not very far apart. You right. know, in the same courthouse. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 I mean, Judge Judge Owen was, you know, a very, very bright and trained uh, musician. And uh, uh, Judge Grisey, as you can tell from reading the, the transcript, uh, really wanted to understand this music. I mean, at, at one point, he said, I listen to a lot of music. So if you want me to to rule on certain things, I have to understand this music. Right. So, you know, we brought equipment from the record plant then. You think by the end of the trial, he became a rock and roll fan? No, he didn't. But uh, <laughs> there, was, there, was a, there was a footnote in the, in the book where uh, the, in 70, 1977, uh, his, his law clerk, Susan Jackson, uh, called me and said, the judge is about to have his fifth anniversary on the bench. We're going to have a dinner party for him and we'd like to give him the two albums. So would you be able to get us the, the roots and, and the uh, rock and roll? And I said, yeah, absolutely. And, and I was going to get them autographed, but that's when John and Yoko and Sean uh, departed for a long trip to uh, Japan. Mm. But uh, he loved the albums and got them framed and uh, they hung in his uh, chambers. And Susan wrote back to me and said, you know, thank you very much. Uh, and the judge became quite enamored of Peggy Sue <laughs> when he was listening, when he was listening to it. And now he can listen to it to his heart's content. <laughs> Also, um, it was sort of interesting that, that, you know, when you had the equipment there, it, it read as if, you know, you had basically played an awful lot of his discography, including Life with the Lions, um, which we like to mention on this show as much as we can, yeah. <laughs> and Two Virgins. And I, and I can't, I, 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 I can't picture this, a courtroom where Life with the Lions is playing. What was that like? Yes, well, I mean, he, the judge wanted to hear some of it, you know, maybe s snippets, but uh, we kept bringing the, the equipment down and then he'd say, well, you know, better bring it back. So we'd have to bring it back again so he could listen to uh, other things. Uh, and then there was the, uh, the amazing moment uh, when we were going to play with Dave Marsh on the witness stand, um, you know, ain't that a shame from the Roots album and Ain't That a Shame from the Rock and Roll album. And the judge got a telephone call. So he had to leave the bench for a few minutes. And that's when I walked back and, and John said, are, are you gonna play the Roots album now? And he, I said, yeah, we're gonna play, you know, at least one song from, from each. He said, I, I'm gonna have to leave. I can't, I can't sit here and listen to it. And I said, leave? He said, you can't leave. The judge, you, you can't leave. The judge is gonna wonder why you're not here. Well, Jay, I can't, I, it's, it's gonna be awful. I, I just can't listen to it. I said, you cannot leave. So hmm. he looked at me and he didn't <laughs> leave. And that's when, that's when Shirtman made the objection. Well, your honor, we don't need an expert to, uh, to hear, to, explain what we you just heard, do we? He said, Judge Grusset said, no, do you want me to tell you what I heard? 
and then he lowered the boom on him. Mm -hmm. Wow. How did the judge feel? Was the Two Virgins album cover held up? Oh, yeah, that came up. Yeah, that's my, during a cross-examination. How did he feel about the front cover? <laughs> he, he, he didn't care about it. Or the back cover. Uh -huh. No, he didn't care. He and, wasn't in any shock. That was, that was all part of, of, of his understanding that John, as he summarized at the end of his award of the damages about John has a different, you know, a career that's different from other, other musicians. Right. No, I love the fact that um, when, when John and Capitol, they're, they're making their case that the sales of rock and roll was hurt from the release of Roots, um, Shurtman would say, oh, but, you know, look at these albums that came out in the very beginning, Life with the Lions and Two Virgins, and they didn't sell that well. And then John had an answer ready there. He said, those are avant-garde albums. You can't expect them to sell the way that you would, uh, you know, typical pop album. So I'm just, it's just fascinating that he was ready mm -hmm. at any given moment to have just the right answer. And the judge, you know, if, if you remember, the judge got that. Mm -hmm. he, he understood that this was not, you know, you were talking about different apples and oranges or whatever you want, however you want to call it, you know, these are avant-garde albums. John Cage, you know, there was some discussion about John Cage and, uh, and these are the rock and roll albums. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, how long did, all, all told, for those who have, don't have the book here or haven't read it, did the case go on for? When did it end? And can you shed some light on your relationship if there, you know, you had one with John that, that continued on, unfortunately, until he passed? No, it, it didn't. Um, on the, the, the case started in January, January 12th, 1976. We tried the breach of contract throughout January. Then we started the counterclaims in uh, March, middle of March and April, actually on St. Patrick's Day. Uh, and John and Yoko came to 20 days of the trial, even days when John didn't have to be there and testify. Morris bailed out uh, quite early. Uh, I think he saw the handwriting on the wall and realized uh, what was going on. And um, the, the last day of the trial on the counterclaims was uh, April 7th, and John's role at that point ended and we were going to do the final argument the oral argument the next day on the 8th and when we got out of the courthouse john said i'm not coming tomorrow i've you know i've had it uh i don't want to hear any more of uh, levy's lies or shirtman's lies uh i now want to really spend time with uh with sean mm -hmm. And um, I didn't see him again until January of 77 when um, we argued the appeal in the Second Circuit. He and Yoko came, uh, picked us up at the, at the office and, and drove down. And that was the, the last time I saw him. Hmm. He had done, you know, he, he had explained very early that, um, you know, I really want to be a father to uh, to Sean because I wasn't a father to uh, Julian. Mm -hmm. So he, that's what he did. Mm -hmm. You almost saw him again, though, in 1980. I almost did. I've uh, I thought about that a lot over the over the decades. Would have been the easiest thing, but. Uh, frankly, I was uh, I was intimidated by Yoko. Hmm. You, you so, tell the, the circumstances for for listeners. Yeah. You. you well, uh, I, I had a I had a recording artist named Eve Moon, mm -hmm. who was recording an album at the record plant. Um, 
she was a singer songwriter and a terrific guitar player from uh, Greenwich Village. And I was on my way home uh, on December 3rd. And I stopped at the record plant because I could get a bus at the Port Authority a few blocks away. And as I walked through the front door, uh, the record plant was on 44th, right off uh, 8th Avenue uh, and into the reception area who was sitting at the end of the room on the couch, but Yoko. And I walked, started walking across the room towards her and she said, what are you doing here? And, you know, that kind of took me aback. Mm -hmm. uh, and I explained that I was there because I wanted to go up to the studio. And I think Eve was up on the uh, 10th floor. Uh, in, in one of the, there were two studios on the first floor and then there was another studio up on the upper floor. And, um, you know, I asked her how John was and I assumed that they were, they were there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I knew they had been recording previously at the, I had read somewhere or heard at the Hit Factory. Mm -hmm. And um, after I spoke to Eve, spent a few minutes with her, found out she, how she was doing, um, uh, I left and all I had to do was just ask her what, which studio is John in? He was probably in the one right in back of me, Studio mm. A. Mm -hmm. Oh, well. Well, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have the, uh, I have the, uh, copy of the record plan documents, uh, mm -hmm. that show um, that John was there with Jack Douglas uh, on the third, the fourth, the fifth, and uh, the eighth, mm -hmm. the day he was killed, the night he was killed. Right. And they were working on um, a single that they were going to put out of uh, Yoko's. Right. On the nice. Oh, they're nice. Yeah. So um, the impression I got from the book was that it was really because of this case with John and Levy that you then went into entertainment law specifically. Is that right? Yes. I mean, I tried to develop a, a practice over the next few years. Um, it, it, you know, I represented uh, Eve Moon. Um, uh, I helped uh, Amy Mann until Tuesday get a record deal. Uh, I had another band that I represented face to face. Uh, Jimmy Iovine uh, helped me get a deal for them with uh, Epic Records. They were in a movie with uh, Diane Lane called uh, Streets of Fire, which was directed by Walter Hill. Mm -hmm. um, but it never, you know, it never really, you know, went very far. I did represent a few years later, uh, Albert Grossman, Hmm. in a lawsuit against uh, Bob Dylan because okay. Dylan stopped paying Albert on the advice of his accountant, accountants, uh, the royalties that he was supposed to pay as a result of the agreement when they severed their relationship in the uh, early, you know, late 60s. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. I, kind of went, I really kind of went back to my litigation. Hmm. You also worked with Grand Funk Railroad, did you not? Yes, that was before, well, I represented okay. Terry Knight, okay. uh, who was the manager and the founder of Grand Funk uh, when he and the band uh, got into a uh, typical manager band, you know, argument about royalties uh, and everything. Right. And that, that brought you into contact with the late John Eastman. Yes, yes. And... Uh, I tell that funny story about uh, uh, John explaining to me how he did not like the Eastmans and uh, did you know them? And I said, no, I didn't know Lee, but I knew John. And I had to explain to him why, why I knew John and that he was, he was the, the lawyer that the band went to, to when they needed a, to get out of the agreement with Terry 
but then John Eastman was not a trial lawyer. So he hired another small trademark firm uh, and, um, and a small litigation firm to represent the, the band. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's when he made the remark about, you know, he didn't like John Eastman and uh, asked me what I thought of him. And I said, you know, he was really kind of full of himself, but uh, he, he really blew it in a meeting before a federal magistrate. And that's when John said, well, John Eastman was born with a, uh, a dark suit, a white shirt and a dark tie uh, at 40 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Would you just, um, I know there's a few times in the book when you mentioned this restaurant that you used to go to with John and Yoko, Sloppy Louie's. Tell us what that was like, the atmosphere. I went and I Googled it because, you know, I want to go to some of the same places where they went to eat and Sloppy Louis doesn't exist anymore. No, no, it doesn't. Uh, well, the first day of the trial, uh, we got in the limo at the lunch break and uh, I said to John, what do you want to eat? And he said, we're only eating fish. And I got the feeling that Yoko had a lot to do with their, uh, their uh, what they ate, mm -hmm. because later on they showed up one day uh, with a quart jar, and I asked John what it was when we were in our office, and it was um, <clears throat> garlic juice. And he announced that Yoko had decided that this was very healthy to drink garlic juice. So during the, the trial before Judge Grisey, they would sit in the courtroom and drink take sips of this garlic juice. But, but anyhow, I, when he said, we're only eating fish, I asked the limo driver to take us down to the old Fulton Fish Market on the East River. And I knew there were some great seafood restaurants there. And he pulled up in front of Sloppy Louis. And uh, we went in, very, very plain and simple place. Uh, wooden tables, no tablecloths, you know, nothing fancy. And, um, we ate there every day for 20 days. Wow. wow. That couldn't have been too sloppy, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I mean, the food, the, the seafood was, was fantastic. And there was only one time. It was kind of a, a place that the Wall Street, some of the, the investment firms would go to because it was right down in that area. And um, there was only once where somebody uh, recognized John and approached him about uh, an autograph. But one of his rules was, boy, his, this was a real rule, uh, no autographs while I'm eating. Right. Fair enough. But after he was done eating, he would sign the autograph. Yes, he would. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, at my, I'm, I'm the jokester, I think, of this, of this podcast. But when you mentioned the, uh, the garlic, um, juice. Uh, I just pictured myself. You always see these court cases where the client and the lawyer are having, you know, they're leaning into one another, you know, whispering, <laughs> you know. Uh, during this period of time, did you have the pleasure of having John come close to you to uh, ask you something or say something and just completely garlic you out? Uh, well, that was the only day they brought the the garlic. Oh, but, good. It was only once. But yeah, it was only. Oh, once. good. Okay. But. But when, in our, when our office in that morning, and I said, you know, what's what's with the, the jar here? What's in it? Garlic juice. And he said, do you want to taste it? And I said, well, no, let me just smell it. So I took the top off and and I, <laughs> I said, boy, that'll that'll clean out your nasal passages. Yeah. I'm not going to drink it. And fortunately, he did not, you know, ask me to take oh. a sip. And later in court, you were sitting on the opposite end of the uh, courtroom. And <laughs> well, they were sitting in the back. <laughs> you know, they were sitting in the spectator section. They didn't have to sit at the table with us up front. Uh, I want to ask a question about uh, the forward. Bob Gruen, the great Bob Gruen, uh, contributed the forward uh, to your book. Um, um, I want to tell us a little bit about your relationship with Bob. Well, Bob, Bob showed up to take the picture at, of Sloppy Louis, and I, I had never met him before. And, and then uh, he took the picture that's in the book in the courtroom uh, when John was testifying. And he, uh, uh, I, 
I found out later that he had smuggled a camera in, but when we were leaving the, the, the courthouse that day in uh, the limo, I said you know, to John, I saw, I saw Bob Bruin in court today. What was he doing here? He said, well, I had him come down to take a picture of me testifying. And I said, you know, that's, that's not really permitted. It, it may even be some kind of a crime or a violation of the law. He said, oh, it's all right. He covered the camera with his coat because uh, this was in the winter. And I said, well, why the picture? And John said that someday I'm going to write an album of all of my songs uh, and the Beatles uh, album of songs about all of my and the Beatles legal problems. And that's going to be the cover. That's great. But later on, I mean, uh, Bob and I met and uh, became good friends. And uh, when I asked him to um, license some of these photos so that there are eight of his photos in here, uh, he, he agreed, gave me a very good, very good deal. And then I asked him if he would write the forward. And he, he said, I'm honored. Nobody has ever asked me Wow. to do that um, i i'd love to mm. bob's a good guy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we know a few times he's a very cool guy yes yes yeah you know one thing that um i was surprised to learn <clears throat> is that while this court case was going on it wasn't publicized at all really in the media and i'm wondering why why that was and i'm also wondering if maybe if i mean we already said that john was pretty confident throughout this whole process but he also had uh people in our government trying to get him deported at the same time i'm wondering if this might have weighed on his mind while this was going on or if this this case might in any way affect the other well it never really it never really came up uh, except that um kind of in april of 1975 i learned about the immigration case, the deportation case uh, from David Dalgenis, uh, my partner. And uh, I asked him some of the details of it and how Leon Wilds was representing him. Uh, I didn't know Wilds, but uh, he was apparently a highly respected uh, immigration lawyer. Mm -hmm. And um, I knew that the US attorney in the Southern District in the federal court there, uh, Paul Curran, was a good friend of two of our partners. And I had the idea that, and David and I discussed this, of whether um, our two partners could make an approach to, to Curran, Paul Curran, who was a highly, highly thought of uh, trial attorney in New York. Uh, he had been appointed by Nixon in, in 1973. Mm. Um, and, but now Nixon was out of, out of office as of August of 74, 1974. And I thought maybe, you know, these two partners just approached uh, Paul uh, telling them, you know, who we, who we were, we were representing John, how much John wanted to stay in the, in the United States. Yoko by now was pregnant and uh, so we talked to Harold Sider and Leon Wilds, and they thought that was a good idea. And then I got David to bring John in to the office one day and explain that to him. How we, you know, this would just be kind of a, a schmooze. Mm -hmm. And um, he thought it was a good idea. I said, you know, not like we're trying to interfere or anything. Uh, we would just be. Um, uh, letting Curran know how important it was to you and Yoko uh, that, that you stay in the United States. And uh, around that same time, um, he had been denied permanent resident status. Yoko already had uh, permanent resident status because she had gone to college, right. uh, had lived in New York. So they weren't trying to deport her, but uh, it was really Nixon and Strom Thurmond's idea to get him out of the country because he was appearing at some of these anti-war, anti-Vietnam War rallies, and they didn't like that. Uh, but, you know, Nixon was gone. So 
around that same time, um, Wilds, Leon Wilds learned that there was a uh, particular rule under the immigration service where uh, a, uh, a person could be granted what's called non-priority status. Uh, even though they might be subject to, um, uh, to deportation, there might be you know, humanitarian reasons why it, they would not have to do that. And so in May, Curran suddenly wrote a, a letter to the federal judge who was handling the case, who happened to be Judge Owen, hmm. and said to him that he had suggested to the immigration service that they kind of start this process all over again with new people who were not involved in the earlier decision to not give John permanent resident status and review that from the get-go. And ultimately, uh, he was given, uh, awarded something under this, un this non-priority status where they would not deport him. And then the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, which John, which Wilds had appealed, uh, ordered the uh, immigration service to hold a whole new hearing on John's permanent resident status. And actually in June of 1976, uh, the immigration service granted it and he got his green card. Right. Hmm. We've all seen the footage of that. <laughs> How so happened it was that? I, I did have a chapter in the book about that, but we took it out. Uh, along with a couple of other chapters because it, it just didn't fit with the flow. But I, I don't know whether our, uh, you know, little interruption helped or not, but uh, it certainly didn't hurt. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good to know. When you do the uh, second edition, you should add it back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, this has been tremendous having you on here, Jay, and telling this story. And we want to remind everybody the book is called, uh, Darren's ready, I'm ready, Lennon, The Mobster and the Lawyer from Jay Bergen. And uh, I want to remind everybody, it's still a prize on my website that you can win. And Jay has signed it himself, okay, with Beatles Trivia, my weekly Beatles Trivia. Thank you so much for joining us, Jay, and sharing all these memories of John with us. And um, Thank you very much for having me. It was fun to be here with the, with the three of you, particularly a... Uh, uh, a man from WFUV and a former New York Times writer. Wow, wow, <laughs> and a and, and a Bronx and, and a, a Bronx. happens to be a very sad Mets fan. Oh boy, oh. <laughs> I'm I'm surprised, uh, Darren, that the your shirt isn't completely soaked from tears. Uh, <laughs> it dried. I had dried it before we did the show. I had it in the the dryer, so. Um, very, very down, but, um, got to stay loyal and wait till next year. You know, it seems to me, if you're from in the Bronx, you could be rooting for a team that wins. I don't know <laughs> of any team that, that, that <laughs> is in the Bronx. No, I, uh, that's, I didn't, is there one? Yeah. Don't start. So that was a lot of fun. It was. I learned a lot from that book and that, that I, I recommend that book. To anyone who's interested in John and, and his work, it's it was it's really good. Absolutely. And I was the last one of the three of us to get my hands on a copy. So I immediately was kind of pulled in by what you were. I think um I don't remember if you mentioned to Ken or Alan about how John talks at length about his the music making process. Yeah. Which I found inter interesting, even though it was not the um, you know, was not the core of the story. Those kinds of details, I, I, I and that was part of the, the book I read in its entirety. So, uh, and then afterwards, right before we started doing this show, I did look on eBay to see if I could track down a copy of Roots. Oh boy! Knowing it's a pricey thing, but see, you know, may, maybe I, I'm always looking for the guy who doesn't have any clue on what he has. <laughs> 
Uh, you know, you always hear these things. Oh, I saw I, I picked up a, a butcher cover at a yard sale for a nickel. I'm like, why can't I run into these yard sales? Uh, but there was one copy as of today on eBay for a thousand dollars. And the problem with Roots is that there are bootlegs of it. So it's, yeah. it's is that a real one? That's a knockoff, right? Your timing was perfect. <laughs> this is the bootleg of it. Yeah, this was a, a legit. The guy had pictures of everything. The labels, the record was in pristine condition. The labels were that color, but they had all the you know the Adam Eight logo and the writing. And some sort of other something in there about a guarantee about it being an authentic, you know. Do you remember the um, either of either of you remember see, ever seeing the advertisement on TV for the album? Now, Adam Eight presents one of the most incredible artists of our time, John Lennon, singing fifteen of the great rock and roll hits, never before available anywhere. Yes, you get fifteen great hits in one fabulous record album for just four ninety eight. Hear John Lennon sing, "Ain't That a Shame." Slipping and a sliding. Be My Baby. Do You Want to Dance? That's right. Only $4.98 for this new and priceless collection of John Lennon singing 15 great rock and roll hits. Hear John Lennon's version of Peggy Sue. Peggy Sue, Peggy Sue. Boney Maroney. Boney Maroney. Angel, Baby. Angel Baby. Yeah, yeah. Never before available John Lennon performances of such rock and roll hits as Sweet Little 16, Stand By Me, Just Because, You Can't Catch Me, Bring It On Home, Rip It Up, and the fabulous Bebopalula. Yes, John Lennon sings 15 great rock and roll hits, all in one fantastic album for just $4.98 or $5.98 for eight track tape. Here's how to order. There's actually a video that I posted when I interviewed Jay. Um, of this guy on YouTube going through how you can tell a counterfeit from the real one. But um, it's, it's, it's really interesting. There's mm -hmm. supposed to be a whole bunch of other albums on yeah. the back here that are advertised. Those are crazy. Um, and that you can read legibly. Actually, you can read this, but there's only a couple albums mentioned. But this is definitely a counterfeit. Anyway, so it's I've got some news to tell you. It's kind of rare that we're doing this after the interview, but you know, things went so well with that interview, I, I just said, let's leave it for the end. So right. this is what's happening, the latest in Beatle news. And the big news of the past week, as I'm sure you all know, is that Ringo Starr tested positive for COVID. And after canceling two of his concerts, had to cancel six more shows. So far as we know, Ringo will resume performing tomorrow which is October the 11th in Seattle and ending October the 20th in Mexico City. Ringo hopes to reschedule his remaining concert dates. And as we learn more, we will let you know. This tour is snake bit with this uh, virus between, um, I did see, uh, and we're recording this on Monday, uh, October 10th. I did see on Facebook, not long before we started, Ringo's posted that he's tested negative. Right. And there's a photograph of him there and he's ready to get back to uh, to the tour. Yeah, I mean, after having to postpone dates because um, Edgar Winter got COVID early and Steve Lukather had also gotten COVID, they had to postpone a lot of dates Then they picked up on those dates <laughs> um, last month. And um, so now there's another... I believe it's seven, six or seven shows they're going to have to reschedule. All right, but it will be happening. Uh, the Los Angeles Times is reporting that a pilfered tablecloth 
from the night of the Beatles' last concert at Candlestick Park has been recovered and is now going on the auction block. It's described as 14 inches by 17 and a half inches cotton tablecloth bearing food and drink stains, oh. autographs and several acid inspired doodles and portraits by the Fab Four and Joan Baez. This item was created during a catered dinner they had in a locker room at Candlestick Park. The price is being offered uh, to the public in a bottoms online auction beginning this Friday, October the 14th for an estimated between 15 to $25,000. This tablecloth belonged to caterer Joe Velarde, the owner of Simpsons Catering, and he proudly had it on display at his store on Clemens Street in San Francisco for six days until someone smashed the glass and stole the tablecloth. The Velarde family had been searching for this tablecloth for the past 55 years until miraculously, Velarde's grandson was contacted by someone in possession of the tablecloth after her brother was given it in lieu of a debt from the 1970s. The tablecloth features a number of sketches, including a yellow one by John Lennon depicting a hairy creature on a bike next to a series of wheels, a series of portraits in various inks by Joan Baez, possibly it says with minor contributions from Paul McCartney, with an inscription in an unknown hand, did not lay a hand on this table, and bubble lettering in orange pen that said Paul McCartney, the listing said, Ringo Starr's autograph is in black and Harrison's autograph in red pen. If you're interested in making a bid for this, let's go to Bonhams, B-O-N-H-A-M-S dot com. I'm most interested about the food and the drink stains myself. I don't know about you. <laughs> I'd rather invest in a copy of Roots. <laughs> In commemoration of the Beatles' 60th anniversary of their first UK single, Love Me Do, two previously unseen photos of the group have been released, taken in July of 1961 at the Cavern Club in Liverpool, then with drummer Pete Best. The group was wearing leather trousers with cotton tops, taken three months before John and Paul went to Paris and came back with what, what became the Beatle haircut. The photos were released by Trax Limited, a UK-based dealer of music memorabilia. The photos were taken by a fan of the band who is still alive and lives in the suburbs of Liverpool, but who asked not to be named. Ringo Starr's upcoming release that we talked about in our last show, Live at the Greek Theater 2019, will be coming out in four different configurations. A two CD set, a combo two CD Blu-ray set, also a Blu-ray separately and a DVD separately. It is listed, all of these configurations for November 25th on Record Store Day. Uh, so the final record is a Record Store Day item. I wonder how this is gonna, I'm not familiar with them ever putting out a, an exclusive record store day item that has variations that are commercially available. You know, I don't know if this is necessarily a record store day item. It's just not it released the same day because you're having all these configurations. Yeah. I mean, the LP is on the record store days website <clears throat> and listed amongst the special releases for the day, along with, you know, what is it? Old wave and um, bad boy. So well, I got this from the Fest for Beatle fans. Yeah. Right now. Julian Lennon has been busy of late, releasing his first new album in 11 years, Jude. That was in September. And now on his website, he is offering his recent performance of his dad's iconic song, Imagine, as a white seven-inch vinyl record for $11.98. Pre-orders for this record will ship on or around November 18th. Speaking of Lennon's, we just reported that Sean Lennon's new experimental work called Asterisms was due to be performed for four concerts at the Stone in New York City. The last two shows for October 7th and 8th were canceled because Sean also tested positive for COVID. Yeah. Sean said he's hoping to reschedule those two shows for a later date. 
our good friend Madeline Boccaro, who just wrote the wonderful book on Yoko Ono, In Your Mind, The Infant Universe of Yoko Ono, went to one of those shows. She told me she, she describes it as avant-garde jazz with amazing musicians, and Sean did play guitar on stage for this. There was a tribute concert for the late great drummer, Alan White. It took place on October the 4th at the Paramount Theater in Seattle. Our friend Shelley Germo was there, who says it covered all the bases for Alan's legendary career with over 100 artists participating who had connections to Alan's five decades in music. Beatle fans know Alan for drumming with John and the Plastic Ono Band at the Live Peace in Toronto concert, as well as drumming on uh, John's classic recording of Instant Karma and the iconic album Imagine as well as George Harrison's iconic All Things Must Pass album. But most of all, being the drummer for the progressive rock band, yes, for 50 years. And this concert was emceed by Bob Rivers, along with his co-host Spike and Joe, who did a hilarious skit reenacting when John called Alan on the phone, asking him if he'd like to play with the Plastic Auto Band for the Live Peace in Toronto show. Alan, thinking it was a prank call, hung up the phone on him until John called him again to reassure him it was the real John Lennon. The current lineup of Yes was there to perform a, a set of classic Yes songs. And um, Alan White was also known to play frequently with Beatles tribute bands in the Seattle area. Quite a legendary career right there for Alan White. Another new Beatle book will be coming out called Lyrics to Live By, The Beatles, A Words and Music History of Life Lessons from Songs from John, Paul, George, and Ringo. It's due out next year, June 6th, uh, by Stella Barnes. The book takes a look at the foundation of the Fab Four's most influential lyrics. It'll be coming out on hardback, and there'll be a Kindle edition, thanks to uh, John Bazzini, our good friend, for that information. And finally, a reminder that the George Harrison Tribute, which is a festival honoring George and the other Beatles, will be taking place at White's in Westport, Massachusetts, October's 28th and 29th. Uh, it'll feature musicians from New England, uh, all playing George Harrison music and Beatle music. There'll be raffles, merchandise, and proceeds will go to Cancer Research. And I'll be doing some of the emceeing for the Saturday show, which is October the 29th. Again, at White's in Westport, Massachusetts, the George Harrison Tribute. And that's it for Beatle News. So I guess we should sign off with our uh, pers uh, personal contact information as we've reached the end of yet another show. Sounds good to me. Why don't we start with you, Darren? All right. You can uh, look for me on Facebook. Two Facebook pages. You can uh, join both of them. They're a little different, not much, but uh, Darren DeVivo, send me a friend request or... Um, forward of uh, not forward <laughs> follow or like whatever it is on my other page uh which is a group or a page i don't facebook mixes me up but it's darren devivo at wf uh, no it's darren devivo wfuv dj i named it i don't remember what it is but just do a search and uh we'll catch up there uh if you want to send me a personal email and we could talk about alan and ken without them involved um you could email me at Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. Uh, as for listening, uh, I'm on WFUV in New York City, um, a Monday night, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night, starting at 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. And then on uh, Saturday afternoons from 1 till 4 p.m. at 90.7 FM in New York City. Um, you can stream the station anywhere. You can listen to us anywhere, uh, WFUV.org. Same thing goes with our app. You could download that, um, go to wherever you get your apps and download the WFUV app and you can uh, listen to us there. Next. Okay. I have to go look for a book right now, but Alan, why don't you give the folks your information? Okay. You can get in touch with me at Facebook. Um, I also have two accounts. Um, we have these accounts in stereo, except for Ken, I think, is in mono. Um, <laughs> um, 
you can find me there just as Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, you can also find the McCartney Legacy page on Facebook where we periodically post some pictures or little articles, anything we feel like. Uh, and I have a little more information about that um, appearance that uh, Adrian and I are doing um, just after the book comes out in December. Um, it's December 14th at 7 p.m. at the Grammy Museum Experience at the Prudential Center. Oh, so it's at, oh, they're going to have it at Prudential Center. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then and I've been there. I mean, I've covered some concerts there, so it's a nice place. Um, anyway, so that's that. Um, you can email all of us. So you can't, you can, you can still talk about Darren and Ken. It won't really be behind their back. Um, that is at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. We also have a Twitter feed at things we said fab. And we have as a group, two Facebook pages. So there is things we said today, plain old things we said today, and things we said today, Beatles radio fans. Um, as you probably know, the shows are posted there. Uh, links to the shows are posted there to the, to the YouTube version. Um, we hope you subscribe to the YouTube version or subscribe to any version that allows you to subscribe. That would be helpful to us. The audio versions on Podbean, on um, iTunes or iPodcasts, uh, iHeartRadio, lots of places. So check them all out and subscribe to us on all of them. Yes. Anyway, that's it for me. All right. As for me, if you want to get in touch with me directly, you want to say something behind their backs directly to me, it's every little thing at att.net. I also have a Facebook page, but I only have one. Okay. It's really simple. Just go to Ken Michaels. You'll see me with a very cute dog, my late dog of several years, who I named Nilsson, for Harry Nilsson, and uh, be a friend there. Um, on my YouTube channel, which is called Ken Michaels Radio, I just did an, an interview with Chris Engelhart, who has just put out this new book called Fully Uncovered. Chris has been putting out books for several years now on Beatles side projects. This is a fascinating world, at least to me, of the Beatles work for other artists, whether it's as musicians, as producers, or as songwriters. And he put out two previous books. This one updates them all with all new information. From the very beginning, from artists like Billy J. Kramer and Peter and Gordon, right up to new recordings like Ringo drumming for Colin Hayes' new album, you know, for example. He's been on top of this for a long time, and I love exploring this stuff because some, some really interesting recordings have come out through the years of songs that maybe Paul wrote for somebody else, or George plays slide guitar for another artist, or Ringo does some very interesting drumming for another artist, or a song that was on the Apple label that John worked on. Um, that's all covered here in this book. It's This is the new one, Beatles Fully Uncovered. So I just did an interview with Chris and you heard me mention uh, the George Harrison tribute concert that'll be happening in Massachusetts in Westport at White's uh, the end of this month. I did an interview with the two people who have been hosting, uh, well, it was it was called George Harrison Tribute, for many years, it was then called Harry Fest. It's gone back to being called the George Harrison Tribute. Rachel and Wayne Cabral have been doing it for, well, ever since 2004. It's usually towards the end of the year, October or November. And um, all the money from this tribute show goes to cancer research. Beatle bands, solo artists from New England, all playing George music and Beatle music. And sometimes there's authors there, sometimes there's videos shown, they have raffles, it's a big fun event. And so I talked to Rachel and Wayne about the history of the George Harrison tribute. And they also are in a Beatles tribute band. They've been in for many years called the Onos. It's O-H hyphen N-O apostrophe S. And they play Beatles and solo music and they go deep 
into the Beatle and Solo Beatle catalog. They talk about that as well. So I have those two interviews. Those are my most recent ones. I'm going to have a tribute to John uh, video coming out probably tomorrow, uh, which will be the 11th or the 12th. And uh, several more interviews coming up in the next couple of weeks. So again, that's Ken Michaels Radio. If you can, please subscribe to that. My other uh, podcast on the Beatles called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. The most recent show, we celebrated our 100th episode. Wow. And we did that, thank you, uh, by inviting many of our viewers to join us for a Rack Our Brain show. And that's when they all ask us opinion related questions about the Beatles, the solo music, we'll throw in the group as well, that we're, we have no idea what they're gonna ask us. We're totally not prepared for those questions in advance, but they just spring it on us and we all answer all their questions. It was a real fun episode. And um, actually, since I mentioned Chris Engelhart, who I just interviewed from my channel, he will be on the next show of Talk More Talk. And um, and that will be on October the 24th, okay? You can watch Talk More Talk on our YouTube channel, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, and uh, subscribe to the channel. And just like things we said today, we're on all audio platforms, you name it, Spotify, Apple Music, iHeartRadio, we're on all of them, Podbean. So if you can, if you wanna listen to us, you can do so on those platforms or you can watch us on our YouTube channel. And of course, there's always my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, where you'll find Beatles trivia every single week. You can win the Jay Bergen book, autographed by Jay, as well as uh, you have a choice of nine other prizes every single week, whether they're books, CDs, DVDs, sometimes vinyl, you name it, you can win it on, on my website. All right. Well, this has been a, a wonderful show. And, and again, thanks to Jay Bergen for joining us. And we hope that you all enjoyed it. And we'll be back again in a few weeks. It's almost revolver time. Mm -hmm. We'll be doing a few shows on that, I'm sure. Thanks so much for watching. And uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>